A confined space is any space or working area in which, by virtue of its enclosed nature, there arises a risk of death or serious injury for people working there. That is just a, a simple definition of a confined space. We will have the more acceptable description of what a confined space is when we talk to our resource speaker here tonight. For us to have a common ground, I would like to show you what a confined space is. So let's watch this video. These are confined spaces. Kaizen, duct, vault, storage tank, culvert, ship's ballast tank, septic tank, trance, pit, boiler, tunnel, well, digester, manhole, silos, shaft, sewer, furnace, ball mill, chemical storage, hopper, sewage pumping station, siphon, fall chamber, bunker, compactor, grain bin, manure tank, storm water tank, sumps, chamber, elevator pit, vats, vent, grain elevator, rail car tank. Now, you have an idea of what a confined space is. Mga kababayan, nagbabalik po ang inyong lingkod. Kabayan, Rico ng Tatak Pinoy, loud and proud. And tonight, this is a very special episode kasi kasama natin ang isang competent person as far as a confined space is concerned. So, this is a good learning session online on confined space. Time for me to introduce our resource speaker for tonight. And by the way, we'd like to greet those who are watching us. Please share the video para ma-share din natin yung knowledge sa ating mga kapwa safety officers. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Our guest tonight is a registered nurse by profession, served with total safety in Qatar as an HSE officer before coming to the United Arab Emirates, where he started working in the HSE training field, where he worked with various companies in different industries such as Rolls-Royce, Samsung Engineering, the Marriott Hotels, Atlantis, Simix, Emirates Aluminum, Ace, ASGC, and many more. He began a career with Buscales as the the SHEQ admin representative aboard a Buscales diving support vessel operating in the Arabian Gulf, then moved onshore as the regional SHEQ engineer supporting projects in Sudan, Qatar, and United Arab Emirates. He is a NIBOS IGC passer and currently taking the NIBOS International Diploma. He already passed Unit C. He is a member of the Integrated Risk Management Association of the Philippines or IRMAP here in the United Arab Emirates. So I am proud to introduce my good friend, uh, looking free and looking single as well. I'm talking about uh, engineer Oliver Garcia. Magandang gabi, engineer Oliver. Ayana. <laughs> Good evening din po sa inyong lahat. Oh, um, ito yung uh, pagkakataon ng mga kababayan natin, especially those working in the field of uh, health, safety, and environment to learn more. Being a competent person, alam ko na marami kang maibahagi sa amin. So, oh, may meron ka pang wala ka bang friends dyan sa field of health and safety na gusto mong batiin bago natin umpisahan? Um... Yeah. Um, hi po sa lahat ng members ng IRMAP. Oo. 
Sí, um, sí, Jennifer, ¿por qué mismo? Oh, <laughs> Agent, si, Para uh, tayo mga Arthur. kaibigan na nanonood, uh, we have friends from iSave as well. Uh, Jay Hobie is watching. Shane, Vince, uh, Rinaldo Dudski is also watching. He's actually from the hotel, but uh, he wants to learn as far as the HSE field is concerned. Uh, Jima Cervantes, uh, Bong Bong, JJ Helter Brand, and Brian Gatula is watching. Also, Max RT from the Philippines. Kaya marami tayo. Oh, umpisa pa lang yan. Mamaya, mas maraming uh, mag-join sa atin considering that uh, this is a very important uh, topic, Oliver, considering that marami sa ating uh, mga kababayan working in the field of health, safety, and environment. Uh, you name it, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, and even in the Philippines. And here, in the United Arab Emirates. Kaya marami talaga nating uh, ikaw mismo, marami kang maibahagi sa kanila ngayong gabi. Kaya this is the opportunity to ask questions as well. Kaya kung meron kayong tanong, di, uh, mag-comment lang para makikita natin and Oliver will answer it to you. Um, Umpisahan na natin nga kay para mas ganado yung mga manonood. I understand that you are working in the marine offshore oil and gas industry. Um, do you have a confined space where you work, uh, Engineer Oliver? Engineer Oliver talaga. Oliver lang, okay na. Ah, sige, Olive na lang. Akala ko, babae lang talaga ang tumatawag sa'yo ng Olive. <laughs> well, yes, we do. Uh, when it comes to confined spaces, so whether I'm whether um, aboard vessels or production platforms or expo exploration rigs, uh, even in onshore facilities, so whether refinery or um, support installations, there are any number of uh, locations that you would name as um, <clears throat> confined spaces. But I, I must say, confined spaces are not only found in one industry. As you said um, in the introductory video, there are any number of them in other industries as well. They can be found in the manufacturing industry, uh, the services industry, the construction field, uh, power generation industry, and even in our own homes, of course, depending on circumstances, obviously. So, yeah, quite a number. Being uh, a practitioner in the field of safety, I know you are in the best position to to clearly define what a confined space is. For the sake yeah, sure. of those who are, meron kasi tayong mga baguhan na who are not really aware of what a confined is, I mean, what a confined space is. So, why don't you describe and define a confined space? Okay. Um, sure, we'll, we'll go through, we'll go by the definition stated by uh, the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health uh, Administration definition. Uh, for this one and for that we'll go to 29 code of federal regulations 1910.46 uh, now in there it is stated that a confined space are basically those locations that have three general characteristics first of all it is not designed for continuous human occupancy <clears throat> secondly it is a space that's large enough to enter and uh, perform work and then thirdly, uh, it is a space that has restricted means of um, entry and exit. So those are the three um, general classifications there or definition characteristics, more like it. Now, by that definition, we can think of many examples as you presented. But to me, when you say confined space, I, what comes to mind automatically is uh, storage tanks and manholes. Those are the two most common examples I can think of. With the definition that you, you gave, I'm sure, because I read in, in one article that uh, there are actually two types of confined space. So would you like to add more on the, the two types of confined spaces? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, well, first of all, we, we discussed earlier the general uh, characteristics of a confined space. However, OSHA does have uh, another definition for a confined space, and that is a confined space 
that ha that is requ that requires a permit in order to enter. Now, <clears throat> sorry. Um, one might wonder why you would need to um, to enter a confined space, and um, that is certainly uh, understandable. But but before we go to that definition, the second definition of a which is a permit required confined space, I would like to um, invite you to imagine what would what it would be like if you if one has to go inside a confined space. So and why one would want to enter inside a confined space. The answer obviously is work, but but before that, let's 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 imagine how it is to be inside a confined space. For example, the fuel tank or a ballast tank of a ship, as mentioned earlier. Now that space is it's it's dark, it's it's hot, it's uh, humid probably, uh, particularly so when um, entry is being performed in the middle of summer or during summer, and then. Um, it also has an overpowering smell of diesel inside. And it can be quite difficult to get inside. Uh, depending on the location of the tank entry in a vessel, you might need to be uh, something of a contortionist to get inside. The same thing when you go out. Um, the surfaces may be slippery, and then the bottom of the bottom of that tank, it's not a smooth floor. It, it is. It is. It well, the fuel tank of a ship has baffles. Now uh, you might find it difficult to breathe. Not that you might, not that you find it really difficult to perform the act of breathing, which is inhaling and stuff like that, and then exhaling. But it's it's more like you get a feeling that you seem not to get enough air. Now knowing this, now why would why would anyone indeed want to enter a confined space? Now the obvious answer, obvious the obvious answer for that is when some maintenance or some repair needs to be done. Uh, for example, in our example, in a fuel tank, um, diesel fuel does have particulates which over a period of time settle down into the bottom and then they form sediment and it may clog strainers and, and filters. I imagine that would be the same for any other tank, uh, particularly that contains liquid or any fluid that has particulates in it. Now, it may, it may clog the strainer or uh, filters, it will add weight, or it could be that remote sensing elements or the tank level monitoring system may break down, may need replacement. So, yeah, people sometimes need to go inside and perform repair. Maybe the tank itself needs some repair. So having, having said that, we'll go back to that definition. If you remember, I said it, it's hot, it's humid, it's got overpowering smell of diesel, but that's not. But that's not the only thing that's inside. Now, all these things <clears throat> um, it, with all these uh, things that's inside that space, it wouldn't be difficult to understand why a permit is required to go inside a confined space. Now, a permit required confined space has the following uh, characteristics. So in addition to the th previous three that we spoke about, it's not designed for human uh, occupancy, the general one, uh, difficult to get in and out of, restricted means of entry and exit, and it's not designed for human occupancy. On top of that, we, mil we will add for con permit required confined spaces, um, it it's got a potential, uh, already has, or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere Secondly, it is it has it has material uh, that has potential for engulfing sa sa tagalog panat matatabunan yung entrant yung taong pumasok sa confined space. Um, third, um, it has an internal configuration um, such that an entrant may be trapped or asphyxiated inward by by the configuration of the space, inwardly converging walls or a floor that would slope downward and then paper to a smaller cross-section. Pag nahulog, when you slip, you go down there, you get stuck, can't breathe. Or the, the, the last term, which is a catch-all term by, by OSHA, it says there, um, 
it may contain any other recognized safety or health hazard. So those are those are the that's the definition of a permit required confined space. So going back first, you got your general definition, the first three, and then for a permit required confined space, it must have uh, one or more of the following, which I mentioned. Again, going back, it's a potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere, already has one, um, has a material that can engulf an entrant. Third, it has an internal configuration that can pose a hazard, or fourth, contains any um, other recognized uh, safety or health hazard. So that's it. So those are the two definitions you would find in 29 CFR 1910.46, which is the standard OSHA standard for confined space work. Since you mentioned that it is uh, the presence of a hazardous atmosphere, do, do you require a permit when you send people to enter a confined space? That would be the practice uh, that, would, that is um, mandated or required by, by OSHA. And the same with, um, you would find the same, well, slightly this, slightly different wordings you would find in the UK HSC um, definition. But yes, they all require a permit to enter for the, for the reason that they've got hazards inside. So a permit is indeed needed uh, to enter that space. What, what are the usual hazards that people encounter in a confined space, Oliver? Well, there's a lot of them. Uh, if we go by the previous previous characteristics stated by OSHA, wow. one is a hazardous atmosphere. Hazardous meaning dangerous, risky <laughs> atmosphere. Now it's it's got it may contain uh, material, usually bulk, bulk material, um, engulfing an entrant, pedisang matabunan, or again an interior uh, configuration, and then going back, uh, any other recognized uh, safety or health hazard inside, but. The map by far, uh, the most common is a hazardous atmosphere. Is what you would, what you would find commonly. Where do this uh, hazardous atmosphere come from? Well, but first, we'll 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 before we go to that where where they came from, we'll we'll define what they are. So. Can, can the you hazard. give us a sample of what a hazardous, what comprises the, the hazardous atmosphere? Yeah. Um, a hazardous atmosphere, you can basically group them broadly into three categories. First of all, it's a flammable gases. The second one are toxic gases or VOCs, volatile organic compounds. And then the fourth one, uh, sorry, the third one, are well, something to do with oxygen. So when you think about hazardous atmospheres, just think about anything in the air, by this we mean gases, uh, that has the potential to cause harm. So may that be a flammable gas, toxic gas, or question of oxygen. Basically, it's about the presence of the, or the absence of any of these gases. And then it's all about levels as well. So just how much of a gas is there or just how much of a gas is not there. So three, uh, we're looking at three, flammable gases, toxic gases, and volatile organic compounds. Although VOCs, you would not exactly call that a gas, but fumes rather. And then oxygen deficiency or excess um, of oxygen. Um, I, I believe when we say flammable gases and toxic gases, that's easily understandable. But there may be uh, people who would, you know, wrinkle their eyebrows and say, "Why is an oxygen excess um, a problem?" Well, it's it's not yet a problem. It's it's more like a potential problem. Um, oxygen deficiency easy to understand. Oxygen excess. Mm kind of weird, but um, 
because excess oxygen normally is not a problem. In fact, as uh, hospital, we need begin with patients ng 100% uh, oxygen as part of a therapy, uh, depending on the condition, obviously. Uh, but in confined spaces, it poses a hazard because it has something to do with the risk of increased flammability of materials when inside a confined space. You know, the same issue when you're in a hospital, um, when patients are given 100% oxygen, uh, sorry, yeah, 100% oxygen, and then inside the tent, you normally would find signs that says no smoking or something like that. Basically, they're very allergic to sources of ignition in the presence of enriched oxygen atmospheres. It's nice to know that a friend is uh, joining us from Buruj. Uh, merong tanong, uh, Oliver, from Jay Hope. What will be the requirement in the conspi uh, confined space entry, I guess, because it's, it's, it's only abbreviation, CSE. So the way I interpret this, con confined space entry. Yeah. So basically, you're looking at for oxygen. Uh, is the question about the oxygen level? Rick, is the is the question about oxygen level? Um, that, that, I guess that's one. Yeah, but I, right. I I I think he's asking for more requirements. Like before, you will send somebody to enter a confined space. What are the requirements? I guess. Okay, all right. Let's start with oxygen then. Um, you know that normal oxygen uh, level in the atmosphere is about twenty point eight percent. That's that's. That's what science tells us. But inside a confined space, you would be looking at range. What would be the acceptable range? So the acceptable range in confined spaces is 19 point, 19.5 to 23.5% uh, oxygen in air by volume. That's for oxygen, okay. For flammable gases, because there are three issues there. So again, flammable gases, toxic gases, and oxygen deficiency, we already addressed um, oxygen deficiency, oh, sorry, oxygen levels, so 19.3, oh, sorry, 19.5 at the lower level, and then a maximum of 23.5% uh, of oxygen in air by volume. For flammable gases, that would be around, we would like it to be down to 10% or uh, less than 10% of the lower, expose, uh, lower explosive limit. For flammable, uh, for toxic gases, that depends on. You would need to look at the MSDS for a particular um, gas. For example, if it was hydrogen sulfide, uh, depending on who you speak to, some would prefer five ppm and some would prefer ten ppm or less. Well, obviously less than those, less than ten ppm or parts per million. So. Where do you get these values? You'll get these values in your multi-gas detector uh, when you do your gas testing uh, in the space before you enter. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, is it correct? Um, and there's another one that, no, I don't know. Uh, probably we we just wait for his uh, further reaction. Um, you know, when we speak about uh, confined space, there is only one gas that would uh, immediately like provide uh, a scare or a gas that we fear so much. We, we call it uh, hydrogen sulfide or H2S, okay? What yeah. makes this gas hazardous, uh, Oliver? Ah, uh, that's, um, first of all, as a gas, you don't see H2S. Um, you might smell H2S, but only at low concentrations. Uh, depending on you, who you speak to, that's 0 0.005. Very low levels. You can smell it, and it smells like rotten eggs. Uh, so um, you can't see it, but you can't. But you can smell it at low concentrations only. And then what happens is that at higher concentrations, as it as it as you breathe more of the gas, and then as the concentration goes up, ppm wise, what happens is that H2S kills uh, your sense of smell, the olfactory nerve, 
So it's it's kind of like it's kind of like you know when you go to a perfume shop and you want to buy perfume and you're sniffing perfume all day long. After that, your nose becomes fatigued. So that's why they they give you coffee beans to smell uh, instead, just to get your nose to get your nose to reset or something like that. But H2S uh, has somewhat a similar effect. It kills the sense of smell. And then that by itself is a problem because normally what people uh, think is that when they can't smell it anymore, then they would rather tend to think that there is no more H2S uh, in the vicinity, that it's, it's, it's gone. And then they think everything's okay. When in fact, an increasing concentration of H2S is becoming deadly. In fact, the uh, IDLH level for H2S is around 100 ppm. Now, IDLH level, as defined by the National Institutes for Occupational Safety and Health, is uh, IDLH means immediately dangerous to life and health. Now, obviously, if you're near a source of H2S as it off gases as it comes out from its source, it may increase in concentration up to the point where at, at around 1,000 ppm, a single sniff of, uh, of H2S can cause uh, CNS toxicity, which can lead to breathing problems, even paralysis um, at times. Uh, it can, it's also very irritating to mucous membranes in your, in your mouth, in your nose, in your eyes. So which is why protection for H2S is usually a full face mask. Before we'll uh, move on with uh, the questions, Oliver, I'd like to promote uh, three books here tonight. Um, it, this is written by my friend uh, Teresa Binghai, coming down from a lockdown. Uh, it's available. You can just message him. Another one is uh, written by a frontliner, Net Javier, um, Smile Across the Miles. And if you are planning to venture into stock market, this is the ideal book for you. Um, Piso Master, written by Lyndon Angan. So it's all available. You can just visit their Facebook pages. Now, uh, how important is atmospheric testing in a confined space? Critical. Absolutely critical. Because, like, like I said, most of the hazards, at least, at least in my experience and, and speaking to, if you look at literature and then speaking to colleagues and, uh, you know, uh, guys who are in the safety field as well, safety practitioners, uh, atmospheric hazards form a large part of the hazards inside a confined space. So it is, it is critical that we know what's inside that space uh, before, before we even attempt uh, entry inside the space. So we have to know what we're dealing with. So the way to do that is use your multi-gas detector, provided you have one. Absolutely critical. I, I was observing uh, three years back, uh, I observed a, a safety officer conducted uh, a, a gas testing in, in a vessel. And I, I noticed that uh, they were measuring the, the gas in different levels. Why do we have to test gases in the different levels? Well, if we go back to chemistry, then you would know that each material, or let's, let's not go to that. Let's, let's go to the MSDS or the material safety data sheet. On the physical characteristics um, section, um, you would find that for they would there would be information on vapor density of a material. Now let's use, for example, hydrogen sulfide, because you mentioned that. Hydrogen sulfide has a vapor density of about 1.19 air. So in other words, H2S is heavier than air. Now with that, it tends to normally sink and uh, goes down the low places in the absence of a breeze, 
uh, such as inside a confined space, wala namang hangin doon. So they, materials or gases in there tend to behave in accordance with uh, their density. So toxic gases, which are heavier than air usually, then they usually settle at the bottom of the tank and there are a confined space flammable gases which are which tend to be lighter than than air they tend to be uh, they tend to collect at the upper portion of the confined space now they behave because of their vapor density they behave they they, they stratify themselves so they form layers inside the tank there is no there is no wind there is no breeze there is no so they behave by stratifying themselves according to their density in air. So when you test, if you put your uh, sampling hose way down, you will only be sampling, uh, likely sampling toxic gases, uh, and then miss out on the flammable gases, which is near your hole, near your entryway. For example, if, if, if the entryway for a storage tank is near the top, then you'll be missing out on the flammable gases. So we test uh, in levels. So one at bottom, one in the middle, or depending on what your company procedure says, just test by level so that you get the gas. Uh, it, it, you know, target them according to their stratifying behavior. Monitoring the air inside the confined space is required before entering, right? In fact, when we test the confined space for atmospheric hazards, it's being done remotely. What are the things that we need to consider when we do the testing? Well, lots of things. First of all, <laughs> lots of things. Uh, first of all, it would be great um, if there are oxygen levels that are adequate for the monitor to work. See, your gas monitor requires a certain level of oxygen in order to work. Um, bear in mind, these gas monitors uh, rely on uh, pellistor sensors and electrochemical sensors, all of which require certain level of oxygen in order to work. Um, also, uh, when you when you test, it's, it's a single test. It's uh, you might need to check from time to time. The situation inside and outside of the tank may change. There might be contaminants that's entering the confined space. There might be a leak of a hose inside that causes the oxygen uh, level inside the confined space to rise. So you do need one uh, properly calibrated equipment to um, testing more than once because you have to monitor the space and um, a properly calibrated, uh, duly calibrated equipment. I believe it was uh, every six months, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Did I answer the question? <laughs> Based on your experience, because you've been working in the the offshore and even onshore, what are the common mistakes in the uh, monitoring of this uh, atmosphere? Uh, come again? I, I didn't get the What question. are the common mistakes in confined space monitoring of atmosphere uh, temperature? Uh, believing that the, the once you test, then it's it's all okay. Just one test, and then yep, that's it. Sign the permit, enter, folks. You can go inside, start over work. By the way, a, confine, a, a permit, a permit required confined space. When when one gets issued a permit, uh, it is not a work permit. By the way, let me clarify: it is not a work permit. It is an entry permit. All right. So um, the entry permit, once it is signed, it's it's basically a document that says this, the 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 conditions inside that space is within acceptable limits and people may enter. However, that permit can be revoked if there is a change inside uh, the confined space pertaining to atmospheric 
or any other hazard inside the confined space. Did I get that? Yes. Um, I, I noticed that uh, every time we send people to do jobs in a confined space, uh, I, I notice that sometimes we, we ventilate, right? So mm. when, when are we required to ventilate the confined space and why do we have to ventilate? Well, we go back, well, we go back to risk assessment then. Uh, in that regard, you need to do your your hazard identification and risk assessment. First of all, um, if it was a storage tank, if it was me, I, I, I think about what's what was inside that tank. If it was a fuel tank, then, and then I'd look at the re existing regulations as well. Obviously, you can't ignore that. But let's say in the absence of regulations, and then you just use your risk assessment. You'll have to think about the characteristics of the material that was stored in that tank uh, for some time. So uh, if it was diesel fuel, then you would you would anticipate, first of all, that, it, you know, it might it's a, it's a combustible material, not a flavorable one. It, it's a combustible one because the ignition points are different. Flash points are different. But um, well, what I would do is looking at the diesel characteristics, go into your MSDS, and then decide now when when you should start and um, when you should start uh, taking out that atmosphere, or clearing out the atmosphere. Um, in the marine industry, they, they call it gas freeing, and it may co it may consist of just opening vents. You know, a confined space may have one, two, three, four uh, routes of entry and exit or ingress and egress, if you want it that way. So they may just open it and then leave it on, for, leave it open for 24 hours and rely on um, natural ventilation to disturb the gas and hopefully um, lower concentrations inside the space. And some procedures, some company procedures would prefer mechanical ventilation, meaning the use of fans, so that you are more in control of the rate of gas evacuation from that space. So, yeah, my, my point I'm trying to put across is look at your, uh, do your risk assessment. What, what was stored inside that space? What's its characteristics? Then I'll plan accordingly. Uh, according to that, like, do I need to do mechanical ventilation? Do I just do I just do uh, gas freeing? And then after I after I do the ventilation, then of course we would test the space. So in in most cases, it is far preferable to do your uh, ventilation, mechanical means of ventilation, not just rely on natural. Um, natural circulation of air to move the gases out of there, assuming there is a gas. You mentioned risk uh, assessment earlier. What are the factors to be considered in making a risk assessment for a, a confined space activity? Not much different from what you do in your regular um, confined, uh, sorry, in your regular risk assessment for any other work area. Except that, we go back to the basic definition. First of all, it is something that is not designed for continuous human occupancy. Getting in and out of that place is very difficult. And you know, sometimes you need um, uh, an extraction device to, to get people inside uh, or to get people out of that place. Um, there is no natural ventilation in that place. People can easily overheat, particularly over here when it's uh, ambient temperatures are quite hot and uh, people might find it difficult to breathe. Then you, you have to think about, because of that, you have to think about um, the physical health status of people going inside or who's supposed to go inside that space. I mean, not, not, not to, um, uh, put down people with, with uh, perhaps certain 
certain uh, physical limitations, but people with respiratory issues might 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 have an issue inside the space. Uh, people with cardiac issues might have an issue over that uh, inside the space uh, during the course of the work inside the space. And you have to think about what, what's gonna happen. What, what can you do if something does indeed happen inside that space? How would you pull them out? How many hours would it would would you need to pull them out? Now remember, it's very quite difficult to pull them out. Next, I would think about the material inside uh, that space. Now, ideally, we would have gotten the the material. That space is now that tank for example is now empty and then we've locked off all avenues of uh, possible contamination or entry of any other substance inside that space so what i mean is for example valves are closed so that tank can be used anymore uh, blanking uh, of pipes so double blank uh, stuff like that and then you do your, you know, lockout tagout. So that's that's so you are reasonably confident, reasonably confident, especially if you check uh, that the condition will not deteriorate. For example, there is no contamination um, inside that space. There are no more material that can enter that space. Therefore, your uh, source of contamination is relatively controlled. So after people and uh, preparing the space, then I would think about and your emergency um, equipment. Should something happen? Then you have to think about the materials you're bringing in inside uh, the space, aside from the material that was stored inside there. If you need to do your coatings, how do you need to apply it? How do you need, how do you apply it? it, does, it does it require just a roller? Do you need to um, need? Do you need to spray paint inside? You know, depending to that, you might need some surface preparation, pressure wash it, or whatever it is. You might need to sandblast in the inside spaces. So all these things you need to you need to think about. And then you need you need to you need to have a way. To monitor that the space is the atmosphere inside the space is indeed uh, with it, staying within acceptable limits during um, the conduct of the work inside uh, the confined space. Kind of long, Rick. <laughs> um, ano ba yung mga sample ng safety entry procedures in a confined space? Well, what was that again? Uh, can you give us uh, a sample of uh, an entry procedure in a confined space? Entry so, procedure. Yeah. Be before you ask somebody to enter a space, wala, meron bang uh, procedure na we can ensure that the, they can return home safe and sound? Ano yung dapat talaga mga steps? Meron ba tayong uh, proper steps? First of all, it's not insurance. I would think I would think it's it's something you do to lessen the chances, reduce the risk, basically. So, procedure-wise, um, I would think about first of all the competency and qualification of people before they enter. In. Are they have they been trained? Are they aware of the hazards inside the space? What could happen? Do they understand? the hazards and then the risks involved in entering a confined space and what they can do and what the entire organization can do to reduce uh, risk uh, to a level that's as slow as reasonably practicable or alert. And then I would look at, uh, I will have a procedure to check my equipment. Uh, if it was, if we could, if we can reasonably affect uh, sorry, expect uh, hazardous atmospheres in form of flammable gases. Um, is my equipment suitable uh, for that? So there must be a process to that. Um, in this case, do I have X-proof lighting or explosion-proof lighting or explosion-proof means of communication? And then 
procedure wise procedures to ensure that number one these guys have been um, um, the work has been discussed uh, that's usually in a toolbox talk and then we in a toolbox talk we went throughout the procedure uh, the work procedure also the communication procedure so how do we update the guy staying outside how do we let him know that the guy is working inside is all okay hey, okay everything all right so how do we communicate that fact or if there is an issue how do we signal the guy who's staying outside of the confined space and then finally there's that permit process which is written uh, in most in most cases I, I think that's uh, that's that's a legal document I believe because you'll need that to you'll need that permit to demonstrate that steps has been taken and it's documented and it's something that you can use um, as proof something has been done in order to ensure that the guys going inside have the going inside the space um, are as safe as we can make them to be since we are already talking about entry in a confined space so yung unang ipapadala natin they are considered entrant right uh, so, yes that's correct ano bang classing training dapat uh, maibigay natin sa mga entrant para siguradong uh, hindi maging November 1 ang birthday nila. <laughs> November 0 even. Anyway, uh, yes. I mentioned earlier uh, procedures that you would need or in general requirements is how I perceive it to be for entry inside a confined space to be as safe as you can. Uh, made safe as you can or as we can. Uh, first of all is training and, uh, uh, and awareness. First of all, training. There are any number of training providers here in the UAE uh, and any other place as well providing uh, training on in confined spaces. Now, uh, it's, it's not just, uh, if you ask me, it's not, it, it shouldn't just be a one day course. <laughs> I, I would prefer it's a, it's a three-day course because you need to put a, a training in confined space rescue. But basically for entrants, they need to go through a training and um, a third party who is knowledgeable on the topic and competent on the topic. So training that informs them of the risks, what their roles and responsibilities are while inside that space, aside from their work responsibilities. Um, they need to discuss about communicating inside the space, the steps that they need to do before they enter that space, and what to do if something goes wrong. You know, like self-rescue. Uh, yeah, self-rescue. And then what to do if you can't rescue yourself. How to use your PPE. Uh, inside the space, if there are if there are chances that uh, the space is toxic and stuff like that, you might need respiratory protective equipment. It's either... So, it's either from that, I know this is, this is the last resort. We consider it the last resort, the PPEs. But aside from the respirators, what are the PPEs required for, for an entrant? Again, we'll, have to go back, we'll have to go back to what was inside that space. You know, if it was fuel, then it can be irritating to the skin. You might need uh, some disposable coveralls for that. Um, some some diesel may be irritating to to the skin of some people. Uh, if it was uh, has uh, gases, then respiratory protective equipment. Otherwise, you know, your safety shoes. You don't need your vest inside. <laughs> Might need some lighting though, and then uh, some some equipment to communicate depending on how deep you're going or depending on the configuration of the space. I, well, they're not PPE, but yeah, those are those will be some of my considerations. Like yeah, that should be it. PPE, your safety glasses, and if you're doing pressure washing, you might need your uh, disposable um, coveralls. 
uh, you might need gloves the the correct kind of gloves eh? uh, for chemicals for example uh, either boots or safety shoes depending again on the hazard identified hazard inside that space uh, in, depending on certain configurations you might need to uh, put on a harness in certain cases it might be it would it might be a good idea to put on a, a full protection harness and use the dealing you know as a means for its extraction if it ever comes to that so those are the ones i can think of yeah what are the common mistakes in the confined space kasi and uh, aside from uh, those rescuing kasi not only those who are working na ang entrant lang ang palaging namamatay di ba uh, marami din ba based on uh, survey maraming namamatay na yung nagrescue okay so how would we ensure that this will not happen at saka ano yung mga pagkakamali nila Let's let's start from the very top. I think it's about um, policy, because and then adherence to policy. Uh, most companies have uh, an HSE policy, but at certain times, you know, adherence to that policy might might be something less than desirable at certain times. Now let's let's have to uh, we'll have to admit to that, you know, for for many reasons. Uh, operational reasons and stuff like that but also aside from policy is procedure is there a confined space program uh, does the company have a confined space program where you say people entering this this space or who will be entering this space needs to be trained they need to be equipped properly and when we decide to enter that space is the space controlled there are no there are no pipes open, there are no vents open that can, you know, aggravate the situation or initially turn what was perceived to be a safe situation into a hazardous one due to contamination or whatever. And then third is uh, training. Um, not just the initial training, but also a training for what happens if there is an emergency inside the space. Now, I understand that kind of training in confined space rescue, for instance, that could be, that would be quite expensive, may not be affordable by other companies. So possibly an option is to rely on uh, specialized rescue teams, either from the public, uh, either from private uh, entities or from government entities. Uh, you know, the guys who do technical rescue in the civil defense uh, side of the equation. So training is quite important. Hammer home the fact that this is the hazard and then the best way we can deal with any issues in confined space is information, adherence to procedure, um, and training uh, particularly so that it becomes preferably second nature um, what should be included in the emergency procedure oh a lot that's uh that's that's i would think that's a topic all of its own basically it, it's it's <laughs> it's a very broad I'm, I'm sure you, you don't mind sharing <laughs> well just, just to give a, a bit of an idea then on what's involved in, in confined space rescues. Because we did we did try that before. It was an exercise and it was it opened our eyes to a lot of things. Like for example, I used to think that going inside that space is the smell of the stench of diesel fuel is so overpowering that ah, we cannot rely on we cannot rely on filter masks, you know, ma full face masks that rely on air filtration, even though the oxygen concentration, uh, oxygen content inside the space is within normal limits, can't do it. So we needed to provide self-contained uh, breathing apparatus or SCBAs. 
so that's what we thought. But then again, you you start thinking like SCBAs are only good for 30 minutes nominally, but when you're doing heavy work inside that space, you're looking for someone inside that dark, dunk space, hot space, you use up more air than, than you would. So you have to use your, you have to use a, uh, a breathing apparatus that requires an external source of air and then fed through your mask via, via airline. But these, depending on how far you go, you have a lot of airline to, to think about, you know, uh, especially if you have to, which is a problem, if you have to go through a hatch or a sort of tunnel that is only about 30 inches wide. So good luck with managing your line. Then you have to think about heat. So training, training and exercises um, is, is a very good way to find out what your issues are before things happen. So even though we think we know how it is like, then training is an important part. And then next one is how do you manage the incident on, on different levels? Who would, be, who would be the incident commander? What would he be doing? At what point does he call help, call for help? And what preparations does he need to do? Um, who has uh, different roles? What equipment would you need? And uh, what arrangements would you have your interactions with, with, with private and uh, government entities that are stakeholders in a situation like that? So those are the things that we would be talking about in confined space uh, rescue. Aside from that, you'll quickly discover, you know, the guys who you would be sending over to help someone inside a confined space. They'll have to be a bit special because of the strain that it imposes on the body when you're going inside a confined space. It's not a normal environment. It's, it's, it is quite difficult. You know, lugging all your equipment inside and, and the mental stress and the physical stress that a person is going inside, it, it requires, in my opinion, a special kind of individual to be going inside that space mentally as well, because some people are claustrophobic. <laughs> I guess, wala na atang uh, tanong, we don't have questions anymore. Oliver, what advice can you give to those people who are assigned or working in a confined space? I mean, safety officers. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, have a look at your confined space uh, procedure, see what can be improved. I mean, nothing, I don't believe nothing is, I mean, anything is too perfect that it cannot be improved. And you will find, I think we all will find at one time or the other that our confined space entry program, which includes your procedure, specific sort of, of equipment, can always use an improvement. Always. Uh, in, this, in, in, in terms of uh, communications, for example, you might, you might want to have a equipment that will allow you to communicate easier and far safer. Um, the steps that you go to in preparing for confined space entry, it might seem very mechanical uh, during the first few times, and then later on, then you, as you become familiar with with the confined spaces in your facility, then you get thinking about what was inside that space and what would be the hazard inside that space. The, the risk assessment is your bible, basically. Have a look at that, and then that gives you a very good guide on what to prepare for in entering confined space. Next one, the next challenge I would say uh, for confined space entry for safety officers is adherence to procedures. Now the textbook answer is to that is training and awareness combined with a little bit of uh, <clears throat> attitude so that people would <laughs> not mess with you when it comes to that. But also needs buy-in from top management. 
either from the top right down to your uh, immediate supervisor or your next immediate superior. Next is uh, what happens after after the guys have come out of confined space, depending on depending on um, depending on the situation, it would be great if you could ask them about conditions inside the confined space, learn learn some of it yourself. Maybe if there's something in there that can be improved, they found something that wasn't inside the confined, I mean, the confined space program, maybe there's, there's something that can be improved. Um, for, for the guys as well, performing work inside the confined space, just training, awareness, for example, there might be some new developments in, in equipment, in procedure, in regulation. So, yeah, continuous, continuous learning um, about confined space regulations, equipment, procedures. Look at the best practices of other companies, perhaps. Learn from your um, colleagues or attend training. Perhaps there is a new development. So. That, that's what I would do. That's what I would recommend. Looks like we've got a problem. <laughs> Can't hear you. In behalf of uh, Tatak Pinoy, I'd like to thank you all for watching us tonight. We'll see you next Saturday for another episode of Safety Talk brought to you by Tatak Pinoy Loud and Proud. Oliver, thank you. I, I don't Always know a if, pleasure, uh, Rick. Yes, and, and uh, we're looking forward to invite you again for another episode. Thank you so much. And in behalf of Tatak Pinoy, once again, thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.